You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Puya. In this week's program, we'll be interviewing Lawrence Krauss, physicist on origins of universe and things from nothing. We'll also be talking about the appointment of Saudi Arabia to the Human Rights Council and a kiss without borders, a fatwa against sport analysts, as well as censorship by the Warwick University Student Union. Stay with us. You don't want to miss this program. The UN has appointed a representative from, guess where, Saudi Arabia to head, yes, to head the UN Human Rights Council. Hmm. But this is that, that's end of the UN Human Rights Council credibility. Um, what's the point? I would of, think so. What's the point of appealing to United Nations Human Rights Council for violation of human rights? Because the head of that organization is uh, from Saudi Arabia, who doesn't respect any human rights. The slightest dissent in that country is not accepted. Ralph Badawi in prison for for tweeting and writing a, a blog. And I mean, this is uh, this is end of human rights. And I think you you wonder why human rights in the world is in such a miserable state. Mm. I mean, what's interesting is this council has, I think, lost credibility for many years now. They've had Sudan, they've had the Islamic regime of Iran, and now, of course, Saudi's already been a member of it, and now they're just heading it. And, you know, now they're going to be able to appoint key officials in the human rights arena. So, you know, another key official will be the Islamic Republic of Iran. You'll have the Sudanese government, hopefully, and, of course, uh, ISIS, you never know. They'll, since be, they'll appoint ISIS for the, uh, to head women's rights in international. <laughs> this is crazy. I mean, that's end of you. I mean, yeah. they, you know, suddenly you'll see that these institutions um, are not going to be any use for human rights, and human rights defenders need to stay outside this organization. Unless the uh, United Nations cleans up its act, has no cred credibility as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, and you've got, I mean, you mentioned Raif Badawi, who's in prison. You've got a young man who is sentenced to crucifixion for being in, uh, in demonstrations. I wonder the head of the United Nations Human Rights has anything to say about that. Mm. Well, I guess in a sense you could say that Saudi Arabia does represent a form of human rights. It's called Islamic human rights. Well, Non-human rights. Exactly, yeah. And now the other thing in the news, of course, is that Warwick University's student union has denied permission to the Warwick Atheist and Secularist and Humanist Society to have me go and speak there. And, and this is, seems to be a running sort of theme in the universities, in UK universities, that I think they've actually been influenced under the influence of the Islamist uh, groups as well as the uh, pro islamist left and they've got this all this notion of you know nobody can criticize the islamist or you know aspects of islam um, because that mo might upset people the whole point of debate and university the whole point of university is to go and explore different ideas it doesn't matter how outrageous it is uh, to explore the ideas and, and learn. I yeah. think, and, and your student union to stop that, I, I think it's silly. Yeah, I mean, one of the things they have said is that the president of student union has said that he was uh, concerned about Muslim students being intimidated, in, intimidated and discriminated against. And, you know, basically what that's saying is that if I speak in defense of rights, including the rights of Muslims to dissent, the rights of ex-Muslims not to be killed for leaving Islam, then it's a form of discrimination and intimidation against Muslims. Well, that president of the student union has a very low opinion of Muslims. And also, uh, you know, it's interesting that there seems to be a double standard. Um, um, AC Grayling was uh, speaking at Warwick University recently. Yeah. On the issue of. Did he not discriminate and intimidate the Christian students? Because he talked about. Uh, he he talked <laughs> about. You know, um, he, you know he, uh, a, 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 atheism, and human humanism, rights, yeah. and humanism. I mean, yeah. this is yeah. this is crazy. Yeah. I think this is um, they have a thing to come their way. Clearly, the press has picked it up, rightly so. I think this is a great concern, and I think my advice to the uh, student union is to immediately retract that position because 
it's not a good position for trade uh, for a uh, student union to, to have. I, I mean, one of the other things too is the fact that there is this conflation taking place. I mean, we've talked about it many times before of between Muslims as a people who are not a homogeneous group of people. They have many different forms of and opinions and thinkers and class politics and everything going on in the group that's labeled Muslim. I mean, we're included in that group as well very often. There are atheists and socialists and everything in that group and conflating that with Islam so that even if you criticize an idea, it's seen to be discriminatory. And of course, conflating people with fascists. It's like saying every British person is a fascist because of the English Defense League. Effectively, they're saying every Muslim is a fascist because Islamists don't like me to be on the campus. I mean, that, that's the issue. Islamists and pro, um, you know, Islamist supporters within the so-called uh, you know, anti-war movement, we, we, we know who they are. Um, and I think it, we need to put an end to this saga in, in British universities. Yeah, well, I think uh, you know, there has been an uproar over this issue, and hopefully it will mean that sooner than later I'll be able to go and speak there. Uh, but again, I think it raises some very fundamental issues about what is, you know, what is the role of universities, a, a place for free thought and discussions and debates, and also how far uh, are we going to allow Islamists to actually decide who can and who cannot go on universities, Islamists and their supporters. And the narratives, I think, that's yeah, important, that's and, Islamist and narrative. Yeah, narrative, yeah. yeah. A prominent scholar, Islamic scholar, and you must take note of the word prominent because that's what comes before his name in every news um, report on him. His name is Sheikh Mohammed Saleh al Monajed from Saudi Arabia. And he's issued a fatwa, a very important one, that you should all take note of, which is that if you're a sports analyst, well, you should be banned. Because um, analyzing mm. a sport is, stops people from paying attention to religion. And that's all you need to be and doing. And you'll be happy as well because you are sort of following teams and see how they compete. That's not good yeah. saying Ronaldo is, you know, it's not good. Yeah, because I guess anything that brings you happiness and joy is just, no. But he's got history of, uh, a bit of history behind him. Yes, he's the one you were telling me, of course, <laughs> uh, that he's the one who issued a fatwa against Mickey Mouse. Uh, he actually said Mickey Mouse should die because he brings corruption. Did somebody and, tell him that it's a character? Yeah, it's, it's not real Mickey yes, Mouse. Okay. And he also is the one who issued a fatwa against building snowmen. <laughs> because the snowmen <laughs> don't have any souls and you shouldn't... No, because you're not supposed to uh, build anything that looks like a person because then you have souls. I see. Okay. You're, you're representing souls. You can only do trees. And, he's even given a list of things you, you can you make can with snow, like trees and buildings and stuff like that. He, he is full of it, isn't he? He's full of it. But there are people who are, you know, rightly saying this is ridiculous, but There's from some, a very strange position. No, no, so, so, some people have said, actually, uh, this is not against the sports. The sports in Islam is okay because Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, and his wife, they used to race each other. Hmm. She was we, young, wasn't she? That's, yes. Um, we won't comment on that. Well, so, you know, fatwa of the week is... For those of you who are sports analysts, be warned. Now we've got a wonderful interview with the lovely Lawrence Krauss. I met him at the Kamloops Imagine No Religion conference in Vancouver quite recently and uh, you know, I think it's amazing how he does bring such, you know, very difficult subjects. He, he makes them seem quite easy and quite accessible. And I guess that's one of the things about him and people like Richard Dawkins. Uh, I, I agree, because when you listen to Richard Dawkins and Lawrence Krauss, you'll see, first of all, the passion uh, for science and sort of uh, human thinking and looking at things differently it is amazing it, in itself is very attractive at the same time you know the idea of you know the idea that he discusses in terms of things from nothing particles popping in and out of space from from you know it just it's it's amazing it's mind boggling and he, the questioning your thoughts and your given assumptions all the time is amazing and so you see how much science has advanced in the last 
30 days that I last 30 time days. I, 30 years that I remember last time I yeah, looked we, at Yeah, we don't want to know physics. about your age now, right? Yes. Uh, but, I mean, listen to this interview now. When I heard him speak, well, I, when I heard the video, the, the interview just again before the program, uh, I was taken with, you know, um, just this, the whole magic of reality, which is the title of a book by Richard Dawkins. It is really magic and you don't need magic when you've got this wonderful and interesting reality. Watch this interview. Lawrence Krauss, welcome to our program. I wanted to ask you about this theory of yours that uh, some things come out of nothing. Can you explain that? Sure. And first I want to make a point. It's not a theory of mine. It's just a it's just what we've learned on the on the basis of what we learned about the universe. So what I talk about is based on, on well known physics. It's not it's not all speculative, in fact. And so the point is that quantum mechanics tells us that that uh, when you combine quantum mechanics and relativity, they tell us that even empty space is not as empty as you think it is. Quantum mechanics say that says that things are fluctuating all the time. And in, when you add relativity in, it says something amazing, that out of empty space, particles can pop in and out of existence all the time, normally for a very short time. They're what, what we call virtual particles. We can't see them directly, so you might say, well, how do we know they're there? But we can measure their effects indirectly. They affect the properties of atoms in ways we can calculate and predict, and the predictions agree exactly with the observations. So we know that virtual particles are popping in and out of existence all the time. And so empty space is really a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles, which means you can't see them. But if you add gravity into the case, then when you create virtual particles, if their gravitational binding is strong enough, they can become real particles. You can see them. So empty space becomes unstable to creating real particles. If you wait long enough, you'll create particles. So out of nothing, namely empty space, you can create stuff. But even more than that, if gravity is a quantum theory, then space itself is a quantum mechanical entity, and space and time are, and they fluctuate in and out of existence too. You could literally, in every region of space, there's virtual universes that are popping in and out of existence and then quickly going out of existence. That really is happening if, if gravity is a quantum theory, and we have every reason to believe it is. And that means, again, if you create, it turns out, if you were to create a virtual universe, a very small region of space, that had zero total energy, it could exist forever. And it turns out when we measure our universe, as far as we can tell, the total energy of our universe is zero. The positive energy of matter is, is, is countered by the negative energy of gravitational attraction. And therefore, if you were going to create a universe out of nothing and you asked what would be its properties, its properties would be precisely the properties of the universe we see. This doesn't tell us it actually happened, because we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, but it's all plausible. And the point is, we can therefore start with no space, no time, no particles, no radiation, and we can end up with a universe with 100 billion galaxies and 100 billion stars. So that supposed miracle of how you can get all the stuff out there when there was no stuff is not a miracle at all. So um, how, how did it all happen? What's, what's the uh, current well, knowledge on that? Well, we don't know exactly how it happened at the beginning. We know that it's quite plausible. And, but we don't have a quantum theory of gravity. But as far as we can tell, all evidence tells us that, that our universe did begin in the microscopic state of a Big Bang. We can, we can see the remnants of it that tell us it really happened. We can go back and test our ideas of physics back to when the universe was a millionth of a millionth of a second old. But we don't, um, we don't yet know the physics at the very beginning. And not knowing is fine. In fact, it's a, a central part of science. It's, it's what makes it different than religion because you don't make these assertions about things you can't test nor do you claim to have absolute knowledge. We learn about the universe and it keeps surprising us. But the Big Bang really happened. It's not, it's not a hypothesis or a theory. We can measure so many aspects of our universe and it was once smaller and smaller and smaller. We can't go back to t equals zero, but we can get very close. And this whole thing of quantum theory, it's quite confusing and very weird, as mm -hmm. people say. Why is that? Well, quantum theory is weird, but the universe is weird and that's okay. It's not surprising. In, in some sense, it's surprising that we understand anything about the universe because the universe isn't created to please us. And more, moreover, we evolved in, 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 the, in the savannah in Africa to learn how to escape lions, not to understand quantum mechanics. And so it's amazing that we've been able with our brains 
to, and, and mod, the techniques of modern science to learn enough about the universe to discover that at fundamental scales, the universe behaves in ways that appear to be crazy. But it's again, we, that's the case not because we want it to be the case, but because we measure and that is the case. And the universe is the way it is, whether we like it or not. And I think some people find that worrisome, but I find it incredibly exciting because it means that we can open our mind and be surprised and learn that our myopic picture of what is supposed to be the case is not always the case. It's not just true for physics, it's true for idea, our ideas of society. What we may think myopically are right or wrong based on something that people wrote thousands of years ago, we find that now, we know, now that we understand the universe better, those ideas are simply wrong. Well, you know, you mentioned about us being Africans. How How is that? Well, it turns out we now know that modern Homo sapiens evolved out of Africa. A different group of, of early modern hominids called Neanderthals probably left earlier. And then we came out later out of Africa. And we can now begin to date these things. Around 40,000 years ago, we entered what is now modern Europe and also propagated out through Asia, what is now Persia and Asia, and then all the way through to Australia. And we can see that, in fact, we ended up, the Neanderthals disappeared about the same time we emigrated out, Homo sapiens. And that strongly suggests that perhaps we got rid of them. Although we also interbred with them. About 3% of the modern Homo sapien genome is Neanderthal. And we know that because we've been able to dig up Neanderthals and, and find some of their DNA. And we can compare the modern human DNA to the Neanderthal DNA. When you hear all this, it sort of makes you understand why people like religion, because it's much easier. Well, it makes it much easier, but it's such, much less interesting. It's much less fascinating and remarkable. And so I'm kind of sad that people are interested in something that is kind of bland by modern standards. People should be interested. It's amazing, and we're fortunate to live in a time when we've discovered all of this. And wouldn't we want our children to be amazed by the reality of the universe rather than shield them from that uh, amazement? We would want them to understand, to, to have the benefits of everything we've learned as human beings over thousands of years. And part of the benefits of that is understanding reality for what it is. You sound very passionate about science, uh, and some might say that uh, science is a sort of religion. No, because the great thing about science is that it's not a religion, because I can hope for something to be the case, but the minute I discover it's not the case, I throw it out like yesterday's newspaper. So... Faith is something where you assume you have the answers before you even ask the questions. In science, we ask the questions, and we let nature give us the answers. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. This week's Slice of Life is a wonderful picture of two refugees in a tent kissing, and I think... Um, someone who had um, distributed it via social media had called it Kiss Without Borders. I think it's beautiful to see these Budapest uh, um, train station where refugees are camping out because they're not allowed to travel further beyond the uh, um, uh, station. And it's early in the morning, everybody's asleep, and it zooms in on, the, on these two pe people in the tent, just hugging each other, and it's just beautiful to see. Mm. Yeah, it is a really, really lovely picture, and it is very heartwarming. Um, especially to see that sort of love, you know, despite all the tragedy around them and the fact that they don't know what awaits them when they're going to reach a place where they can begin their lives again. And yet, you know, that love and tenderness is there and it's, it's really wonderful. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed this week's program and we look forward to seeing you again at the same time, same place next week. Uh, until next week from me and Mariam Namazi, goodbye. Bye. Hi, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. 
We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discussed taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream. And in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.